We want to give our hearty thanks to B&H Publishing for sponsoring this episode. To learn more about Russ Moore's award-winning book, check out stormtossfamily.com. Thanks again, B&H. My guest today is Dr. Russ Moore, president of the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission, award-winning author, and my former boss. We enjoyed a drive around Nashville, including a visit to the great Stay Golden coffee shop. Well, this is very exciting for me. I appreciate it. Oh, this yeah, is awesome. Glad to so I have a, a gift for you that you may already have already. Oh, I do I, not. You don't have that? Oh, okay. that's awesome. Yeah, so now, I'm, I'm not going to have you wear it. It comes with uh, yeah, a wearable I tiara. a wearable tiara. <laughs> that may be the end of your job. <laughs> <laughs> that, that may be taken a little too far. <laughs> Anything else. But maybe if at some point you want to wear that in the privacy of your own home. Maybe so, yeah. So, I'll neither confirm yeah. nor deny that. Well, thanks a lot. So, so it's it's really a very interesting, I've read the, I mean, I just glanced through it, a very interesting yeah. history of Wonder Woman from the comic books all the way through through our mutually beloved Linda Carter, of yeah. course. And yeah. so I knew this. here now. Does she really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. She lives in have you tried to reach out? There? I have not. No, that would not go well <laughs> right. in my house. Uh, yeah. yeah, because my two, that's true. my two big crushes <laughs> of my childhood and teenage life yeah. both live in Nashville. Who's the other one? Amy Grant. Okay, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I have was, you had any contact with her? That would be more likely you'd run into yeah, her. Yeah, I have. Yeah, but okay. she she is. Um, <laughs> yeah, she was. I was absolutely. Oh, of course in love with Amy Grant all through. She was amazing. Yeah. Middle school, high right. school, yeah. Okay, well, I, I liked Linda Carter as well, Yeah. but I was. it made me think about who I loved was Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched. Did you oh, ever watch sure, Bewitched? yeah, 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 yeah. There was yeah. something about Elizabeth Montgomery that that was my childhood crush for yeah, sure. Yeah, not for me. She seemed too momish to me, yeah. I think. Very, she, she was, she was, yeah, she wasn't the power woman that Linda Carter right. was. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was cutesy and yeah. have a wife that could do magic. I mean, right. come on. Right, I mean, right. I guess you'd have a goddess in this case. <laughs> That's not all bad either. Dear my but, goddess right, is all. Right, for, yeah, don't okay. ask for much. Right. <laughs> well, and it's really interesting, her creator, you know, William Moulton Marston, yeah, yeah. was a piece of work. I mean, there's very this, feminist kind of approach. Well, to things. he was he was very feminist, but he was also uh, was the inventor of the lie detector. He was a really? Oh, I missed yeah. that detail. Well, that's okay. why you know, she has the golden lasso. Ah. It makes you tell the truth. <laughs> oh my goodness! He uh, was a polyamorist in a okay. day when that was not right, right, right. Um, uh, something anyone ever thought about. Right, right. Um, and so, the, when are we talking? The twenties. Or no, no, no. This 30s? would have been in the 30s. Yeah. 30s okay. And he was, um, he was really, uh, he thought that uh, comic books were, were creating toxic masculinity. Use the oh, language. yeah, I did now. read that. You said that in the book. Yeah, yeah. Right. so he wanted, to, uh, he wanted to correct that. And he was a, he was a classical scholar in Greek mythology. Yeah, so the Diana. So part, all of yeah. that right, just right. flowed together, you know. What did you think of the recent Wonder Woman movie? I thought it was really good. I did that too. Whole world yeah, of those. I, li- I liked it. Yeah, right. yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, it's the other world, and he- and here, you know, I'm a Marvel, not a DC guy. Uh-huh. I, still, I mean, I like you a lot, but I don't understand the DC <laughs> thing, man. <laughs> Except for the Chris Nolan Batman, I don't like any of the oh, DC people. Oh, the Chris Nolan Batman was the worst. Oh my goodness, oh, that's the yeah. only good Batman that's no. out there. Oh no, no. no okay, no. well, that, at least we're consistent in our differences yes, of opinion. That's correct. Because I'm yeah. a Marvel man. In fact, our family. We are, my wife has hardly seen any of those, so we've made a commitment. We are watching all 20 Marvel movies in the Marvel Universe chronology, not oh, the order they were uh-huh. released in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started back with Captain America and then we did Iron Man 1, so we're systematically working through them okay. in preparation for the, uh, maybe you don't even care. Are you like so DC, you don't even want to hear anything no, about no, Marvel? No, no. You no, like no, them no. both? No, 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 I, I, um, I, I'm a DC guy, but I will admit that in terms of the cinematic universe, right, right. so far Marvel's done okay. better. Uh, which is part of the part of the shame because the uh, the actual universe DC has so much superiority better? to it. Yeah, that it that really deserves uh, a better cinematic representation right. than what it's had. Well, Superman. I mean, come on. Like nobody can beat him in anything. Oh, well, sure they can. I guess. Well, sure but, they can. But yeah. like in the Superman kryptonite, movie, it's like he, he's he's vulnerable to kryptonite. He's vulnerable to magic. Uh, oh, okay. He's he's vulnerable to uh, parasite. Because siphon is is okay. Uh, okay. What was your first car? My first car was a uh, green Ford pickup truck okay. that was older than I was uh, and was a uh, just a tank of a, of a vehicle. Right. Didn't have very good brakes. 
I had three wrecks in three weeks after getting because my driver's license. Because of the brakes? You, you were well, a victim? no, it was, it was, <laughs> this is the brakes were part of it, yeah. Okay. Brakes were part of it. Part of it was I had no business having a driver's license. In, in Mississippi at the time, you could get your permit at 14, right, your right, driver's right. license at 15. Right. I was not ready to be behind a wheel right, at 15 right. years that old. That's pretty amazing to think of. Yeah. yeah. So one other question I have, if you'll open this up and tell me what's going on in this picture. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a number of things happening here. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a beautiful combination right. of things. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, and I don't remember. I can't remember who it was either. Who did this because they took the picture from, I was speaking at the Vatican in 2014, um, and I was, I was going through the line in order to, to, to get in with the Swiss right, Guard, right, right. and had in my, I, I oh, had in my passport in my coat pocket, and reached in and pulled it out, I thought, but I was wearing the same suit that I had been in lecturing on right, the Reformation right. the week before, and I pulled out a copy of Luther's 95 Theses. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, anyway, I took a picture there. Well, someone knew that, and then they also knew that when I took my kids to see Goosebumps movie, that when that um, ventriloquist clown, oh, yeah. uh, whatever his right. name is right now, it escapes me, uh, shows up on the screen, my then baby, uh, Taylor yelled out, Daddy, you know, in the, in the theater. So somebody just put those two things together. Yeah, that's right. And, and you love Halloween. I know. I mean, Halloween. There, that's kind yeah, of part of that. Works. Right? Yep, like all of that works. Yeah, all of that works. Multi layered intertextual right. picture. Right. It's a, right. we'll, we'll show a picture of it because it's, so, it's such a funny picture. Right, but right. Before we turn to talk about some, some beer work, I guess the probably the most important question I would ask is like, who was the greatest professor you ever hired in Southern? <laughs> <laughs> well, Actually, just I, I, I often tell people you were one of my best hires in Southern. All right, hey Siri, give me a number between one and 300. All right, so as you may have seen, I like to have authors read a random paragraph, and okay. I didn't want you to stack the deck and choose your favorite page or something. Okay. So page 144. 144. You want to read right. something out of the Storm Toss family there, which again, I just finished yesterday and really, really enjoyed it. it okay, great. so where on the and, page? And wherever you'd like, any paragraph you'd like. Okay, all right. Um, a common theme I have observed in adulterous affairs is that the one, I mean, see, so this is, my wife's gonna watch this and say, you're talking about your Wonder crushes Woman, on right? Amy Grant and Linda Carter, now you're talking about adulterous affairs. A common theme I have observed in adulterous affairs is that the one cheating is almost never looking for a new spouse to replace the deficiencies of the old one. He or she is seeking to recapture the feeling of adolescence. See, this is the problem, <laughs> or young adulthood. They are not so much looking for a sexual sensa sensation as for drama. And for a short period of time, the person can be swept up into the drama of I love you, do you love me type of romance. Tell me the truth with your robe, that yeah. kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. Else you die. Without all the burdens of who is uh, picking up Chloe from school or what day to put the recycling bin out at the curb. No, you're really right. So, yeah, that's, that's very insightful. Okay, so you want to launch from that and to, you know, just kind of talk about what you're doing in this chapter, or really the whole book. Like, why did you write this book? Any, any I, I wrote the book because uh, I was dealing constantly with people in various areas of family crisis. They were, they're all very different. So a lot of people who were in this sort of situation, yeah, yeah. Right? and, and um, which seems from the outside looking in to be so obviously irrational. Where have you ever seen right, right. this to gonna fix work your out problem? Well. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, but of course, it, that it's not a rational yep. uh, issue. And one one thing that I've um, it's kind of shifted for my wife and me is a move from what our kids should be to what they could be. Meaning, in the sense that I think when we were younger, we had only this mindset of with this we were, did have a lot of idealism that every kid needed to look right. like this, right? And a and an increased awareness of that each child's calling and their personality and these things like that. I mean, obviously there are some standards, but 
there's so much to how God's made them. Right. That that yeah. that was a real change for us that's happened in the last like even five to ten years, just to focus on how God might be calling each child to develop and who they are instead of for us it was this like really and so I felt like it was really life giving along those lines too, just encouraging because it was you know, several moments where you just kinda of recognize there's not just one way to mm -hmm. do this kind mm -hmm. of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. so. an exciting week that uh, you won the Christianity Today Award Book of the Year for Beautiful beautiful Orthodoxy, I think I, they call it, or something like that. Is that what the title is? I thought is? that was funny because when I saw there's a wearable tiara <laughs> because uh, Tish Harrison Warren, who won last year for Liturgy of the Ordinary, uh, put up on Twitter an image of a Miss America transferring the crown and said, I'll get you your tiara later this week. And God's here we, will. Here it was me. Go. I'm the and messenger. I, I started right? to joke about Anglicans offering crowns always makes me nervous as a Baptist. <laughs> but uh, so here, here we have the tiara. She doesn't even have to send it. That's funny. I know you were honored. And then I saw the pictures of getting the cover yes. done and with a, <laughs> and is this right, with a piece of a shirt from Johnny Cash. Right, because the artist who did that original piece of work uh, works for the Johnny Cash Museum, the Johnny Cash Homestead. Wow, and so forth. okay. And so he knew that that I was a Johnny Cash fan. Yeah, yeah. And he came up with this piece of, of, of art that took one of Cash's shirts, uh, he shredded it and made the, the water. Yeah, that's yeah. Here, that's his yeah. shirt. Uh, then he took a hymnal. Uh, and made this house. Oh, I hadn't house. noticed that before, okay. Yeah, right. the cover of my last book, Onward, uh, yeah. was done by Hat Show Print, the classic music industry poster. Yeah, maker yeah, it, it looks like that, yeah. Yeah, and they used a uh, an old uh, Johnny Cash Sun Records um, okay. uh, album as the background okay. again, for that. Okay, right, that's so, great, that's yeah. great. All right, well, let's get back to the book, anything else you'd want to say in terms of your motivation, your desire for the book? Like why, again, why did you write this? You're saying a lot of people come to you with stories, but what's the vision you're trying to sort of cast for people? About 10 years ago now, I wrote um, a book called Adopted for Life, yeah. um, which was really a way of sort of wrestling with myself through what I had gone through in the process of um, being someone who was, uh, you know, would have thought of myself as pro-adoption, but very reluctant to adopt. Mm -hmm. So going through that process, that was sort of my working through what I had learned in that process as a way of almost speaking to my younger self, someone who's in that situation. Okay. And so as I was working on this, for me, it was almost um, an adopted for life for the whole mm. family. Mm. Marriage uh, and parenting yeah. and everything. Uh, right. Because it's a very similar, a very similar situation uh, with, um, I, I think I mentioned uh, in the book having a, a friend who said to me, you know, I knew that parent, we're talking about parenting. Mm -hmm. He said, I knew that parenting would be humbling. I just didn't know that it would be humiliating. Yeah, that was a great line. I remember that one, yeah. And, you know, I th as soon as he said it, I said, that's exactly right. And, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, ultimately, uh, every aspect of family is humiliating. You talk about parenting with the end in mind, which was, again, the whole book was super encouraging. But that, as well, how I've thought about it is, playing the long game with your mm -hmm. children. And that's what's really hard when you're a younger parent and maybe even, well, just, you know, when you're a younger parent is to, to play the long game and realize I'm raising adults, you know, that are gonna, of course, screw up. Right. And make mistakes right. and have all kinds of problems. But if I keep in mind this kind of long game of it, then um, that frees me up to not be so anxious. Yep. Again, and to be present with them in the now. As I go down, each of my children, I am a better parent. Oh yeah. With, you know, down to the youngest. What's one. the difference? What are you aware of? Why? The difference is because I know 
what to freak out about right. and what not to freak <laughs> right, out about. Right. Uh, really, at every stage, yeah, whether it's yeah. uh, temper tantrums, uh, yeah. you know, happening as a um, as a two-year-old, three-year-old, uh, you still deal with them. Right. But you're not, not you're not thinking, out, yeah. oh no, what right, does right. this mean? I think it was my mother who said one time, and I was. We were in the middle of potty training, uh, the first two, and I was just very anxious about it. This wasn't going as quickly and right. well as I thought it would be. Of course, your plan. Yeah, and she said, you know what? Have you ever met anybody in your life <laughs> who's grown, but who doesn't have some sort of medical issue, who's not potty trained <laughs> just because they didn't learn it? Right, I right. said, no. It's okay, then right. this is going to yeah, happen. That's good. Most of the dangerous areas for evangelical Christianity is putting an either or where there's a both and um, in a way that the reverse, of course, is true, true too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a danger of putting a both and where there should be an either or. So one can't say both. God and Baal, right. uh, both Jesus and Mammon, no, it's either or, uh, one or the other. But I think because, because we do recognize that and we know that, sometimes there's a tendency to then create everything into either, totally. either yeah, or yeah. situations um, that actually just fuels whatever it is that you're yep. afraid of. Yep. thought there was just a lot of good thoughtful balance that was coming out of conviction that was winsome, which was oh, really beautiful you. in the book. Thank and that's you. really great. And I, and I think, you know, whenever we're motivated, kind of speaking from what you were saying, whenever we're motivated by fear, that is, I think, when imbalance is yeah. for sure close to hand. Yeah. You know, on because, either side. Right. Right. Because I think what happens is usually, um, at least this is what I've noticed in myself, when I'm operating out of fear, what I'm saying is because I experienced X. I want to make sure that I stay as far away from that right. as humanly possible to keep it from happening. So it's, it, it becomes, you know, wherever it is, theologically or ideologically, yeah. it becomes exactly what Jesus is identifying with the Pharisees, building hedges around the law to make sure that one doesn't get close to, right, right. to falling off of it. Um, and there are always very good reasons for that. Yep. Because one can say, I do the not want. The conservatives of the right, day, right? Yeah, right. And, they, and they're saying we, we have seen what happens yep. when right. this happens, and of course that's true. Um, but it just, you, you can see it in individual people's lives, you can see it in the lives of churches, you can see it in the lives of movements, where uh, what, what's happening is all an attempt to avoid the last bad thing hmm. in a way that blinds one to what is the next bad thing. Favorite Johnny Cash song? And why? Um, and I don't really know. I hate to admit, I don't really know much about Johnny Cash. I, <laughs> I'm like the worst person yeah, to interview you I because think, I'm yeah. I'm not going to even recognize any of the titles you give me. But I will dedicate myself to educating myself, starting with your recommendation. Well, I like uh -huh. Johnny Cash as a sort of all-around person. Johnny Cash is not by any means my favorite songwriter. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. as, and as a matter of fact. Um, uh, Maria, my wife, was explaining to someone a year or so ago, she said, if you want to really understand my husband, the way you understand it is to know that uh, everybody thinks that Johnny Cash is his favorite songwriter, and he does love Johnny Cash. But if you actually look at his, at his like music, his playlist, or something yeah, his playlist um, it actually is Jimmy Buffett. Okay. He's going to show up more than anyone. But she said, and this is the key, it's not the Margaritaville right, right. sort of Jimmy Buffett songs. It's the Jimmy Buffett's Meditations on Death sort okay. of. So, All right. Um, so it combines your Halloween death of and a, your Yeah. Death of an unpopular uh, poet. Uh, he went to Paris. See, I don't um, really know much Jimmy yeah. Buffett besides Margaritaville. Because yeah, you, you right. go on a cruise, you go all over the world, right. there's like Margaritaville, right. you know, everywhere. Right, right. Right, but I think with with uh, with Johnny Cash, I mean, I would be partial to uh, walk the line. Okay, um, that I do know. Right? Yeah. Okay. One of the things I like to do too is have a random element to it. So down there in the pocket, you'll see some envelopes mm -hmm. um, with different 
random questions in it. You can choose one, doesn't matter which one, and though that maybe that one's already opened. Is it, it not is, supposed to be open? I don't know. Let me see what's going on with the web here. I think that's an old one. Oh, it's an old so, one. Okay. <laughs> so we put it back in there. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah, choose one that's not open. Sorry about that. And uh, there we go. you can answer, and then I'll try to answer it, too. So the handle will be an element to it. What is your greatest extravagance? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that you want to put on camera. And we can let your wife go back and... <laughs> you know, I think what she would say uh, is the greatest extravagance. And she got me as a present one time this uh, chewy nugget ice maker. With the, it's the, the, what does that even mean? Well, it's, this, it. it's a specific kind of the small chewy ice oh, yeah, that you yeah, can okay, get right, at right. some, you know, like right, gas yeah, stations. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. used to be at Hardee's. Yeah, yeah. Know, it's pretty still, rare to find those. Yeah, right. right. And so this makes that. Okay. And so I have that. You have it in your house? Do you use it all the time? I use it all the time, <laughs> every day, uh, all the time. And uh, So you feel it when you go to a restaurant that doesn't have that. It's like, if you're used to that kind of ice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The coffee maker at our house is in the bedroom. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not going to, you know, I, I need that. Right. You, you read in the morning and in bed, isn't that right? Do I know, how do I know that? About yeah, you? but also I just need to, um, I need to start caffeinating very, very quickly. <laughs> the ice machine's in the, in the bedroom. No, it's well. not. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So when do you use the ice though? In the morning as well? All, all day long. Yeah. Like I, to just chew on it or no, in no, drinks? No, no, no. I, I drink, put okay. water on it, or so you go through a lot of beverages. Iced tea. Like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was. Um, okay. At, in Louisville. We'll put that in the extravagance category, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, right? In Louisville, the doctor said to me, um, how much caffeine do you drink in a day? And I said, well, I was trying to think it through. I said, in the morning, I make a pot of coffee. And he said, well, do you all like drink on that all day? I said, well, no, it, no I, I make drink a pot that of coffee, right? right then. <laughs> and then, I said, it wasn't the sum of it. I'm right. just telling you, <laughs> this is how beginning. we start. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So are you supposed to answer? Uh, I'm supposed to answer yeah. too. Yeah, greatest extravagance. Oh my, I hate these questions. They're hard to come Do up with the answer. Do you write these quest as uh, questions or someone else? Well, I mean, I collected a bunch and threw them in envelopes oh, like I six see. months ago, so mm -hmm. I don't remember them or know what's in, what we're gonna get, obviously. Uh, greatest extravagance, um, maybe this car, oh, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. obviously, father of six didn't need a midlife crisis. Right. Is that when Rotary this happened? Engine. Was it a midlife yeah. oh, crisis well, thing? Really. I mean, it's just. How old are you? You got it. Uh, I've had it for years, so. Um, but like I was probably years? forty-five. Oh, okay, right? yeah, well then, so of course, right. it was a midlife crisis. <laughs> I, just mean, I, was, I was, yeah, it was definitely midlife. I was really going through a crisis, and I actually saw this when we were looking at Mustangs. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you saw the doors like open. It's got these suicide doors that open oh, yeah, the other yeah, way, yeah. And, yeah. and I just fell in love with it, and so I just I bought it. <laughs> so, well, just bought it and it, didn't know anything about the car. Didn't know that the engines all die on these. So, like I said, I had to rebuild the engine just recently. But I just, love, you know, it was a stick shift, and I just. So this was well, my I this mean, was my one spurge in life. If you have really. to look right. through John Rawls' veil of ignorance toward uh, choosing one's midlife crisis, a car is pretty good. Much much better You're than much a lot of other options. Off than, yeah. than almost all the right, other options. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> this is my little piece of human flourishing on wheels. Uh huh. So that's uh -huh. my experience probably. I just heard from, I saw that you blurbed it, this little uh, a concise guide to reading the New Testament. I saw that you liked it a lot too. I yes, it was book. delightful, I know. It really was, and I, I picked it up just as, you know, might this be something good to yeah. give to a yep. college student or yep. that sort yep. of thing, and then I just happened to flip it open and said, oh, this is really, it's really excellent. good. It is really excellent. Yeah. Um, and the author sent me an email last night, a really nice email last night. Oh, good. Um, yeah. The Seattle Pacific. The house, yeah. 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 But I hope he keeps keeps writing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because there's, you know, I think a lot more where that came from. Yeah, well, you know, there's it's a new era in biblical studies. It's finally kind of rediscovering canon and theology, which yeah. has been a big part of my own mm -hmm. scholarly life, as you probably know, mm -hmm. and moving beyond kind of these dichotomies between theology and biblical studies and all this kind of stuff. So, I'm reading right now, he's a friend of mine, uh, he's an Antiochian Orthodox priest, and he has a little Eastern Orthodox commentary on Romans. Okay. 
which that's I that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, which I expect, of course, I will be completely at odds with once we get to right atonement and justification yeah. and, and those maybe not completely, not, not completely. Yeah, but right. I mean, I know, I know right. Father Paz. I know there'll be there'll be some right, significant right. areas of difference, but. Um, the first chapter is magnificent, where he's just sort of uh, outlining uh, life of Paul, and mm-hmm. he's he's showing intertextual connections yeah. with uh, with Saul of for Samuel hmm. and Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, very canonical theological yeah. kind of reading. Yeah, and yeah, it's right. just a really, really, yep. Yep. really well done. Uh, well, my so my argument has always been that great preachers. Have always been better than our modernist hermeneutic. Yes. That, that's the irony of it, is yeah. that we actually know how to make those kind of canonical connections, but then we're kind of taught in, when we adopt a kind of modernist view that that's not okay to do. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, and, and, and not even just preachers. Anyone who sings Christmas carols knows right. how to do that. Yeah. Yep. Because you really cannot make sense of Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 with the sort of. Um, the sort of reading that modernism gives us. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> including, I mean, all of the, for all of the, it's so interesting to me because all of the people that I would hear were so worried about, well, you know, you, you're going to get into all of these jumps and sort of hermeneutical gymnastics. If you go, and I look around and say, but they're the ones doing the craziest gymnastics in trying to make sense of out of Egypt I called my son. You're preaching the choir now. Or, I, I mean, agree. You know, we had Carl Henry uh, come into a J-term at Southern one time on the history of American evangelicals. Really? Yeah. And the, it became legendary on the campus because yeah. Dr. Henry got up and said, uh, started off and said, it's history of American evangelicalism. He said this with, that, with no irony at all. It's the history of American evangelicalism. We will start at the very beginning. I was born on October the 3rd, 1917. <laughs> <laughs> only was, he could pull that off. Only he could right do that. Right, was, right. Well, right. yeah, that actually makes sense. Yeah, that's uh, I really appreciate your oh, time. Oh, yeah, and, thank and you. Busy, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Time of life Good for you to see you. going on, and congratulations. On oh, thanks so much. I'll keep the- Hey, one more shout out to B&H Publishing for sponsoring this episode. Down below in the show notes, you'll find links to all the books we talked about. And don't forget to subscribe to our CCT YouTube channel. Thanks. Peace out.